Greetings, and welcome back to the Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. We're very clearly not on our normal Old Ways Rising Farm. Rather, we're in an agricultural warehouse surrounded by the stuff of modern agriculture, the commercial or often called salt-based fertilizers. This video is about these types of fertilizers, and this is going to be a very objective, clear, straightforward evaluation of simply what they do and what they don't do. I think this is something we need to talk about, something that's really necessary, because these are quite controversial in a lot of circles. And a lot has been said about them. It's often said that they will burn plants out, which can be true or false, depending on circumstances. It's often said that they can lead to a sort of chemical addiction that once you start using them in your garden or your farm, you can never stop, which can be true or false, depending on circumstances. It's said that they're made of salt, which is largely true, but we need to define salt, and it's going to get an asterisk. It's a little more complicated than just that. It's been said that they're not organic, and that is both true and false simultaneously in the same product many times. So there's a lot of complexity here. As I said at the beginning of this little intro, it, it is somewhat controversial. I'm not going to take a harsh side. You'll have one side that says these things are magic and just their mere presence near your field will increase your yield 30%, which is obvious BS, right? There's another side that says these things are just pure evil, that the mere presence near your feed field will destroy your crop just, just by the mere presence, which is also BS. If that was true, they wouldn't exist, right? So the truth is in the middle, and the truth is a little complicated. So I hope that you will bear with me, that you will stick through this video, and by the end of it, you will understand the good, the bad, and the convoluted of the discussion with relation to these sorts of fertilizers. The first thing we need to do is talk about what it means for something to be a salt, so that when we discuss something as a salt-based fertilizer, you have the context of what we're actually saying with that statement. For that, we need to go find a whiteboard. When people think about a salt, usually most folks, their brains immediately go to table salt, sodium chloride. It's the familiar one, and rightfully so. But there's many other things that get the name salt added to them, right? You have calcium chloride, which is sometimes used as a fertilizer, sometimes used in ice melt formulas, used to load tires to keep the, the water in a tire from freezing. There's Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate, that we soak our feet in, also sometimes used as a fertilizer. There's saltpeter, used for many, many different things. Um, and all of these get the word salt attached to them because of a particular chemical behavior which goes beyond just what they're made of. So let's describe what that actually is. What is a salt? Well, a salt has two criteria. It must be an ionic substance, not a covalent substance. Okay, we'll get to there in the third example on this page. On this page. And it must be capable of dissolving in water. When ionic substances dissolve, they undergo what's called disassociation. So let's look at how that works with the most familiar example, sodium chloride table salt. Okay? So we write the formula for sodium chloride this way. When it's all together, it's neutral. But the sodium exists as an ion, and the chlorine also exists as an ion. Plus one for sodium and minus one for chloride. Okay? Now, because they are charged, when they're existing in a solid crystal, you're always going to have chloride cozied up to sodium, and vice versa. So you have this repeating pattern. And that's what allows it to crystallize with a regular structure. Okay? But these are not held together by permanent bonds. That's why it's not a covalent substance. Okay? Covalent bonds are permanent. Ionic bonds are transient. They're just stuck together in a repeating pattern by electrostatic attraction. Right? This is the same concept as the whole rub a, rub a balloon on your head and get static electricity on it. It has an attractive force. Okay? Same deal here. You just have an electrostatic attraction holding them together in a temporary but predictable format. Now when you take water and put it into this, you have to recognize that water, because of some other properties that we're not going to go into in this video, the hydrogens in water have a partial positive charge. 
it's not a true permanent ionic charge. It's just a partial behavior of being a little bit more positive than the oxygen, which is a little bit more negative. Okay? So this also allows for electrostatic attraction and repulsion. When water interacts with the salt crystal, it can shimmy up in and force these bonds apart because the electrostatic attractions with the water are stronger than the electrostatic attractions in the raw crystal. So the water comes in and it forces the sodium one way and the chloride the other way and forms a new set of attractions. That's what we call disassociation. This only happens in ionic substances. Okay? So this is soluble. It meets both criteria. It is ionic because we have charges and it can disassociate with water. Second example, iron 2 phosphate. Still ionic. We have charged iron plus 2. We have negatively charged phosphate, 3 minus. This is the same phosphate in your fertilizer. And we're going to come back to this. There's a reason I chose this example. We're going to come back to this a little later in the video. It's really important for understanding how phosphorus behave, or phosphate behaves in the soil. Um, but these attractions in this iron phosphate crystal are so strong, water cannot shove anything apart. So it cannot dissolve. Okay? So it meets criteria one, it's an ionic substance. But when you put water against an iron phosphate crystal, all you get is a wet iron phosphate crystal. Nothing actually happens. So it's not a salt because you do not have disassociation. Okay? Now, this is not just on or off. I'm looking at a profoundly soluble and a profoundly insoluble example, but there is a sliding scale and a lot in the middle. We measure that with what's called a KSP value. Here, if the KSP value is positive, it's tending toward soluble. If it's negative, it's tending toward insoluble. These are extremely positive and extremely negative, but there's a lot in between here. So you can use this to actually directly compare how soluble something is. Okay, So this is what it means to be a salt. Now the third example is also not a salt because it misses this criteria. Bonus points if you recognize this is glucose, the sugar. Okay, so this is how sugar dissolves. It forms a crystal because you have OH groups in the molecule. I'm not drawing the whole molecule here, just the part that's interacting. Okay. And the partial positive on this hydrogen, again, we have hydrogen next to oxygen, so you have the same behavior as in water. Okay? This hydrogen next to the oxygen, we have the partial positive here interacting with the partial negative there, holding two molecules together in the sugar crystal. But just like with this salt crystal, water is strong enough that it can come in and shove molecule A away from molecule B. But the difference is these are all covalent bonds. And again, there's a lot more hanging off of those R groups there, right? I'm not trying the whole crystal. There's not room on the board. But because the whole molecule holds together through the covalent bonds, it doesn't get to be called a salt because no ions are formed. Okay? So calling something a salt describes this very specific chemical behavior of being both ionic and able to readily dissolve in water. Let's go and look at the specific salts and sort of salts that we use in common fertilizers. Fertilizer ingredients. The first thing I want to say about all of these is that they're the same regardless of what brand of fertilizer you're buying. This is nonspecific. These are the common ingredients in all of your commercial salt-based fertilizers. Now, as I said, calling these assault, all salts does have one asterisk, and that's urea. Urea is two ammonias cross-linked on a CO2 molecule. This is covalent. But here's where the asterisk comes in. In the presence of heat or light or bacteria action, it's very rapidly decomposed into back into the carbon dioxide and ammonia which in the presence of water, we're in soil, so we have water there, is immediately turned into ammonium hydroxide, and now we're a salt. So it's not literally a salt, 
but it decomposes into one so rapidly that you might as well just consider it a salt. Okay, that's the asterisk. And then nitrifying bacteria in the soil convert the ammonium into nitrate, NO3 minus ions, and this is the form that plants can use. All of this happens very rapidly. There is a note here. If you don't have water in your soil, this evaporates. So you never want to put down a urea-based fertilizer under dry conditions. It's not going to go well. You need to time it so that it goes down right before rain. Or apply it in a liquid form that's already dissolved. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time because all this evaporates up and it's gone. Now, urea has the formula 4600. This goes to our NPK numbers. The first 46 indicates the nitrogen. This is 46% by weight immediately available nitrogen. Okay. Next one up, ammonium sulfate, 2100, already in salt form. We're done with the asterisk. A little bit less nitrogen, but you get the bonus of having sulfate in here, so we're providing some sulfur to the plants, and this is a very important plant nutrient as well. Superphosphate, 0.460, 0 0% nitrogen, 46% by weight phosphate, 0% potassium. And you have a mixture of these two salts. And then potash, 0% nitrogen, 0% phosphate, 60% potassium, has a whole slew of different things that can go in it, usually with potassium chloride being the dominant one. So these are all of the ingredients that go into your fertilizers regardless of whose brand you buy. Where do these numbers come from? So this is a quick example problem which shows how we calculate what the percentage of a certain element is in a certain chemical formula. If you recognize that this is stoichiometry, a form of dimensional analysis, in its full glorious show all your work on the exam format, good on you, bonus points for the day. If not, don't worry about it. The take home point here is that once you have chosen an ingredient for your fertilizer, it has a certain definitive and permanent ratio of elements within it. This is called in chemistry the law of constant composition. Once you've chosen to use ammonium sulfate, you have 21% nitrogen, period, end of story. You can't change it. What you can do is mix it with other stuff to get a wide variety of formulations. Okay, now you know what a salt is, but I wanted to take you back to the warehouse to discuss how all of these ingredients we were just uh, discussing at the previous whiteboard go together into various formulas. And these are the numbers that you see on the bags, all this dizzying array of numbers, right? Here to my right, we have 0, 20, 20, not 2020, 20, legume fertilizer. Behind it, we have 10, 20, 20, a different legume fertilizer. Off in the corner, we have 21040 with boron, a different legume fertilizer. Behind me, 201010. This is pretty specific for field corn. Okay? And we also have the pure ingredients, 0060. That's pure potash. There's also the, the triples, right? Triple 10, triple 15, triple 19, triple 20. All of these different formulas. When do you use one or another? Let's go discuss that with another whiteboard. So to delve a little deeper into these fertilizer formulas that we're we've been talking about, we need to touch again on the NPK numbers. Okay. So when you look at the nitrogen, what that promotes is all of the green stuff, the top growth. When you apply a lot of nitrogen to a plant, you're forcing it to grow a large number of leaves and to grow in height, okay? Phosphate, when you apply this, you're promoting the development of fruit and flowers, okay? Potassium, you are promoting the development of roots. Now, there is definitely crosstalk between these two. Both potassium and phosphate, in general, produce, 
promote the brown components of the plant, the non-green stuff. So you will get some root promotion from phosphate and some flower promotion from potash. But phosphate is kind of weighted in favor of promoting flowering and potash is weighted in favor of promoting roots. Okay. So you need all three of these to have a healthy plant, but different plants need them in different ratios because of their differing biologies. Okay. Um, if you, one of the biggest mistakes with these sorts of fertilizers, especially salt-based fertilizers, is to oversupply nitrogen to plants that don't need it. If you put too much nitrogen on legumes, you will just kill them. You might as well herbicide them, okay? If you put too much nitrogen down in a dry climate or during a dry year, you will force top growth, starve the roots, and the plant will not be able to support itself. This is where nitrogen burn comes from, okay? Now, you can accomplish nitrogen burn with non-salt-based fertilizers. It's just a little more difficult to do, okay? Um, Over-fertilization with phosphate can cause big problems for your uh, soil microbiology. We'll talk about that a bit more in a bit. Um, if you over-supply over your potash, you're not so much going to do something in and of itself, but you won't have good top or flower growth because you're missing these. Okay, So balance is important and you need a different balance for every type of plant. The general fertilizers are the triples. Triple 10, triple 13, triple 15, triple 19. These are all common formulations. Okay, Triple 19 is basically pure fertilizer. If you take the pure ingredients and you mix them in you know and you mix them in even thirds you get approximately triple 19. now you need a little bit less phosphate a little bit less potash and a little more of the phosphate and nitrogen it's not exactly even thirds because you have 46 46 and 60 as the percentages um but triple 19 triple 20 is what you get when you want an even ratio of ingredients and you want pure fertilizer then triple 15, triple 13, and triple 10, you are backing down the concentration by adding inert carriers. Why do you do that? Well, one reason is triple 10 is often recommended as the general use garden fertilizer because it's not as concentrated, so it's harder to mess up with. So this exists because of how common the if a little is good, more must be better concept is. This is the antidote to that flavor of dumb. Okay? Triple 19 is twice the fertilizer, 50 pounds of triple 19 is twice the fertilizer as triple 10, but it's not twice the price. So if you know how to dose it properly, it makes economic sense to use the triple 19. In agriculture, triple 13 and triple 15 are very commonly used because they're a little easier to apply with less sophisticated equipment. Okay, If you have a GPS-controlled tractor and a computer-controlled spreader and you've done soil tests on a grid across your field and you have a software program moderating exactly how much fertilizer needs to go in which square foot of field, you can take any of these and use them interchangeably because the software is smart enough to figure it out. Okay, But when you're not doing that, when you're using um, simple toe behind or push in front of you with hand power spreaders, it's easier to apply 13 and 15 than it is 19 without risk of over application. Also, you won't tell the difference between 13 and 15. That type of equipment is not sufficiently accurate to detect a difference between 13 and 15. So consider them the same thing. Okay? And Uncle Bubba, who thinks if a little is good, more must be better, give him triple 10. Okay? Don't give him triple 19, he'll kill his garden. Okay? Good. We're down with that. Now, let's look at some of the specialty stuff. The low nitrogen fertilizers are specialty fertilizers for legumes. Okay. 
So 21040 with boron. This is very specific for alfalfa. There are other companies that have formulations of this that are two or three percent off from 21040. This is the most common bulk commodity fertilizer for alfalfa. Those other formulations are interchangeable with this for the same reason that triple 13 and triple 15 are interchangeable. With the equipment you're likely to be using, you can't tell the difference between 21040 and 31343. It just doesn't matter. Okay? So the boron is in here because alfalfa loves it, but almost other plants find it toxic. So when you use this on an alfalfa field, you are making that field selective for the optimum growth of alfalfa, yet hindering the growth of other plants. So if you have an alfalfa hay mix, don't use 21040, use one of these. And if you have soybeans or garden beans or snap peas, use one of these. Okay? 02020 is very common. This is a really good clover fertilizer, um, clover, clover vetch, all those sorts of things. 51010 and 102020 are good general use fertilizers for anything that can fix its own nitrogen, um, including garden crops. Again, the relationship between 102020 and 51010 is the same as 1919 and 1010. This is more cost effective. This is for Uncle Bubba, okay, who's going to screw up if you give him too much fertilizer, okay? But they're both very, very good. Lastly, I want to mention um, the corn fertilizers, 201010. Corn is a nitrogen hawk. Clover can fix its own nitrogen. It doesn't need any, and if you put too much on the soil, it's toxic to the clover. Okay? Corn is an absolute monster when it comes to sucking nitrogen out of the soil. So, usually a corn field has two applications of fertilizer. When you plant it, and this is true whether you're doing sweet corn or field corn or anything else, you use 201010. It still needs some nitrogen in the beginning of the season, but you need the potash and the phosphate in these 210s to get the root growth and the stem growth to have a hardy plant that's going to sink its roots deep enough into the ground to become drought tolerant. Okay? And then after a month and a half to two months of growth from when you've planted, the corn undergoes a change in its biology and it starts to shoot up and form a canopy. When it starts doing that, it wants to grow top, so you put some urea on it. Okay, just direct application of urea. And that gives it the nitrogen that it needs when it wants to produce that abundant top growth. But if you do straight urea too early in the season, you will have big tall corn with no root system and it's gonna be a disaster for you, okay? So these in combination are specific for corn agriculture, okay? So you have legumes, you have corn, and you have everything else. These are the common types of salt-based fertilizers. Now, we need to talk about fertilizers that are not salt-based, and we need to talk about the complexity I alluded to in the introduction to this video regarding what is organic and what is not and what that means. So let's go outside and look at a few things and discuss that topic. Before talking about not salt-based fertilizers, I want to take a couple minutes and talk about organic. This is where it gets really, really complicated because organic has three definitions. Okay? There is the old classic definition of organic, which means coming from life. Okay? Then there is the organic chemistry definition, where carbon dioxide and carbonate ions are considered the inorganic forms of carbon and everything else that contains carbon is organic okay so old comes from life new 
contains carbon other than CO2, okay? Then there's the third definition, and that's certified organic. Certified organic means that a group of lawyers agreed that this type of agriculture would feel organic to the general population. And they did not apply either of the previous two definitions with any consistency. So that's where it gets really complicated, okay? So are there salt-based organic fertilizers? Well, yes and no at the same time. Let's start with urea, okay? Urea is based on CO2, so that makes it kind of not organic, but it's produced by natural systems. Every time you go to the bathroom, you're releasing urea, okay? So that makes it organic. Is it organic by certified organic agriculture? Well, if you buy it in a bag, no, it's not certified organic. But if you look behind me, we have a chicken coop. <laughs> On the floor of the chicken coop are large quantities of urea that is chemically identical to the urea from the bag, but because it was produced by those crowing beauties in there instead of a chemical factory, that is considered organic <laughs> by two of the three definitions. It is, you can use it as certified organic agriculture. It is organic in the sense that it came from life, but it's based on CO2, so it's not really organic chemistry organic. So it's complicated. Let's look at a couple more examples of this. So here's some more examples of convoluted answers to the question what's organic and what's not. This is a little bag of Epsom salts. This is the same Epsom salts that you would use from an Epsom salt bath. It dissolves very quickly. If you've ever soaked your foot in this stuff, you know, it's all, you know, just half a minute or a minute and a large amount of Epsom salts will dissolve. So it's very soluble. It's magnesium sulfate, two ions. Sulfate being negatively charged, magnesium being positively charged. It is a salt, okay? Is it organic? It contains no carbon, so no. It does not come from living things, so no. But if you do a soil test that tells you you have a micronutrient deficiency that involves the need for more magnesium or more sulfur, it is organic for organic agriculture. But only if you have the soil test. If you don't have the soil test, it's not organic. So that's convoluted. Next we have a natural source of potash. In, in fact, the original source of potash wood ashes themselves. This stuff is about 5 to 10 percent, depending on the batch and the species that was burned, potassium. Okay, So it's much lower than the, um, than the commercial potash, but it does contain potassium in the form of potassium hydroxide. Now potassium is very, very uncommon in most sources of compost and living things, right? So the potassium content of a log is very, very low. But when you take a large amount of logs and burn them and reduce it to a very small amount of ash, you have concentrated that potash. Okay? And that is, in fact, where the ash component of the word potash comes from. Okay? Now, potassium hydroxide, very, very highly soluble, also very caustic. It's a form of lye. Okay? So... It is a salt. It meets all of our criteria for a salt. Is it organic? Well, it contains no carbon, so no. It comes from life. It comes from living things, so yes. Is it organic for organic agriculture? It depends. Some sources yes, some sources no. I think that this wood ashes coming from burnt wood fiber is organic from organic agriculture, I think. But if you burn chicken manure, that is organic for organic agriculture when you use it as manure, but if you burn it to concentrate the potash, it's no longer organic by organic agriculture rules. It's specifically forbidden. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. 
You just got to keep your certifying agent happy. Go with what they tell you. Don't go with what I say. I can't follow it, literally. <laughs> okay? So, this is where you get into real convoluted territory and big arguments because the definitions are just fundamentally non-congruent. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about are sources of fertilizer which are not salts and how they are similar and different to sources of fertilizer that contain salts. So a good way to talk about how salt-based fertilizers and non-salt-based fertilizers compare to each other and the ultimate fate of the nutrients from salt-based fertilizers is this set of three compost piles. All of these have the same starting material, and that is bedding from the chicken pens. The first compost pile, the lightest color, furthest over, is chicken bedding that I just removed from their pens this morning. This is absolutely dead fresh. It is loaded with urea. So that needs to be treated as though it is a salt-based, nitrogen-heavy fertilizer. Okay? There's also some phosphate in it, but very little potash. Okay. Now, reference the earlier permaculture chalk talk video that I did on the nitrogen cycle. What's going to happen to that urea? Well, it's going to be broken down into ammonium very, very quickly. Now, as it's broken down into ammonium, the nitrifying bacteria are going to consume that ammonium and convert it to nitrates and nitrites. That's what's happening in this middle pile. This is very little urea left, but it's going to be loaded with nitrates and nitrites. So this still needs to be treated as though it's a salt-based fertilizer. Those are the forms of nitrogen that are immediately available to plants. They're also immediately available to the denitrifying bacteria, which convert them back to ammonium. So you have two groups of bacteria working across purposes here. Okay. You have the nitrifying bacteria taking the ammonium, making nitrates and nitrites, and then the reverse in the denitrifying bacteria. Every cycle, some ammonium is lost to evaporation. So over time, the longer this pile sits here and the more of these back and forth cycles between the two groups of bacteria occur, the more ammonium is lost, leading to the third pile, which is largely denitrified. Okay? Now, what's happening biologically? Well, the first pile is all bacteria dominated by E. coli because it's manure. The second pile, there's still going to be quite a bit of ammonia of, of ammonium in there. There's going to be a lot of E. coli in there, but the E. coli are going to be reduced and starting to get replaced by the nitrifying bacteria. Okay? And we get our saltpeter-rich pile. Now, fungi do not like high salt environments. So as these salts are lost, both through leaching and through the evaporation of ammonium, you're going to get more and more fungi coming in until we end up with a finished compost that is very rich in fungi. Okay? Keep that thought for the next clip, that fungi don't like salts that much. Okay? So on that side, we have mostly E. coli. On this side, we have a balance of bacteria and fungi. And there we have a middle condition. Okay. Now, in this pile that has been largely denitrified, it's not nitrogen free. Because as those fungi start to grow and fill this material with mycelium, they're going to use the available nitrogen, the leftover from this denitrifying process, to make proteins and make that mycelium. So it's still going to have quite a bit of nitrogen left, but now it's no longer immediately available to plants. It's bound up in the proteins of the fungi. So this is no longer a salt-based fertilizer. Though it is highly fertile, it still has quite a bit of nitrogen. That nitrogen is bound and not available as free ions. So when you're adding this compost to your garden, the nitrogen it contains isn't available as soon as you put it down. But as the bacteria grow and die back and are decomposed and then grow again, you will have a gradual release of that nitrogen, which is the behavior of your organic fertilizers. Okay? 
Now, that is organic and salt-based. This is organic and not salt-based. So there are, again, salt-based organic fertilizers. Now, the phosphate really hasn't moved at all. This pile, even though it's depleted in nitrogen, it's not depleted in phosphate relative to that pile. In fact, since it's shrunk in volume, it's somewhat enriched relative to you know, a mass per volume ratio. That's important to know. When you add this to the soil, the movement of phosphate slows down even more. This is because phosphate has very few soluble forms. All of your metal phosphates, other than sodium phosphate and potassium phosphate, other than that group one, group one elements, they're all insoluble. They're not salts. Okay. So phosphate is very slow released and very slowly absorbed and very slow to move through the system. It hangs around practically forever. It's very important to keep in mind when we think about what happens when you apply too much fertilizer. Okay. So we have our gradient from salt-based to not salt-based. If we look at some of the common organic fertilizers other than chicken manure, we have blood meal and bone meal. Blood meal is usually used for nitrogen. It's a slow release nitrogen fertilizer because just like the fungal mycelium in this compost, the nitrogen is bound up in the proteins found within the blood meal. Okay? Bone meal is a slow release phosphate fertilizer because the phosphate is bound up in the beta hydroxyapatite of the bone. That's not a salt. It's not soluble. It shouldn't be. It's bone. If your bones dissolved, you would have bigger problems than a bad, badly fertilized garden, right? <laughs> so it needs to not be a salt. When the fungi and the soil interact and the bacteria in the soil interact with those sources, again, they will slowly liberate those nutrients in scale with what the plants can absorb. But when you're using them, you need to recognize that the numbers on the bag show what's available within the first couple of weeks of application, not the total content. So you have to keep that in mind and you have to use them differently because you can over apply non-salt fertilizers just as easy as you can over apply salt based fertilizers. And that's the final thing we need to talk about in this uh, video series. What is the role of these various kinds of fertilizers and what happens when you do it wrong? So the biggest criticism of your salt-based fertilizers is consistently noting what happens when you screw up with them, okay? Now, there's two big things that are bad that happen when you overapply salt-based fertilizers. You can have fertilizer burn and you will also often hear of sort of an addictive process where the land can become addicted to fertilizer and lose the ability to grow crops if you neglect its addition. Okay? I want to talk about those separately. So first, fertilizer burn. Fertilizer burn has two basic causes. If you overapply fertilizer a lot, it can cause a physical chemical burn on the roots. This happens before you get enough fertilizer to actually cause cell death. Because the way that a root gets, gets water and nutrients out of the soil is a function of the fluids in the root being saltier than the fluids in the soil. Okay? Then when that's true, the process of osmosis will cause water to move from the region of low salt toward the region of high salt which moves water from the soil into the roots and then provides a root pressure to force it up the plant. If you get drought conditions or you over apply fertilizer, both can cause it. You can get fertilizer burn on a properly fertilized soil if there's a drought, which also, side note, never apply fertilizer during a drought ever, ever, ever under any circumstances. You're just gonna nuke your plants. But in either of those cases where you have a good water year and too much fertilizer or proper fertilizer and then a drought, at the point at which the soil fluids become saltier than the root fluids, that suction of water goes backwards. 
And instead of the root sucking water out of the soil, the soil sucks water out of the roots. Cause that, causes them to desiccate and die. That's your extreme case of fertilizer burn. Your slightly less extreme case of fertilizer burn happens when you over apply one ingredient. Okay? This is very, very common with nitrogen because a lot of homeowner marketed fertilizers are extremely high in nitrogen because as soon as you put them down you get a big burst of plant growth okay and that doesn't really cause a lot of harm on annuals because they're going to die in the winter anyway but you're getting that burst of plant growth at the expense of root growth so when you do that to perennials or to farm crops that need to get a good tap root sunk down into the ground you're going to harm the plant overall so you get an imbalance of nitrogen, and you get this big burst of top growth, which consumers like, but is bad for the plants in the long run. The roots, because you're forcing all of the nutrients the plant is able to take into top growth, you're starving the roots. And then as soon as you get stressful conditions, the plant falls over and dies because it doesn't have a root system to support itself. Okay, it's nitrogen burn. Similar things can happen with the slow accumulation of phosphate. Okay? So remember the insolubility of iron phosphate. Remember that KSP, 10 to the negative 30s. Well, that's where most of your phosphate compounds are. Right? Iron phosphate, calcium phosphate, copper phosphate, they're all profoundly insoluble. So when that fertilizer hits the ground, as soon as it touches any metal ion at all, it precipitates out as a solid. Now the soil fungi can reliberate it. And if it then goes immediately into a plant root through mycorrhizal interactions, good, it's into the growing food web. But if it's liberated and then released back into the soil, it crashes out again as a solid. So it does not have the opportunity to leach through. The soil cannot clean itself of too much phosphate. So when you're regularly applying, um, you know, if you're growing beans and peas or clover food plots or alfalfa fields, and you're always putting like 0 20, 20 on year after year after year after year after year, you can build up phosphate very easily. You could build up phosphate to a level at which it starts to cause harm to the soil community in general. Okay. You don't hear of too much fertilizer burn with potash. Because while it, it's not volatile in the way that nitrogen is, so it's not removed as quickly from the soil, mess up with nitrogen the next year, you're fine again, right? You can, you can screw up one year, but you're not going to screw up the next year. Mess up with phosphate, you can screw up a century's worth of growth because it takes that long to very, very slowly move through. Fo uh, a potash... It doesn't move through, it doesn't liberate in the air like nitrogen does, but it doesn't lock up forever like phosphate does. So it's kind of a middle case. So you don't often hear of extreme potash buildup. What you will sometimes hear of is are people using caustic sources of potash, like wood ash, in already basic soils, which can push you too far in the basic direction. Here, in acidic soils, you don't need to worry about it. You're, you're very unlikely to really basify your soil. This is really, really hard to do, right? This is not too big a problem, which is why I use wood ashes as a fertilizer a lot here. If you're down in central Pennsylvania on top of a limestone-derived soil, you should not do that, okay? Um, you need to use other sources of potash that are not basic, so you don't basify your soil, okay? Um, so you usually don't hear too much problem with that. Now, let's keep on phosphate for a minute, and let's talk about this idea of fertilizer addiction. Okay. It is a real thing, but it's more complicated than most people want to present. Okay. I'm here in this erosion gully for a reason, and we'll get there. Okay. This is part of the fertilizer addiction process illustrated on a grand scale. When you look at soils, you have a very important 
ecosystem services being performed by fungi in particular. Okay, The biggest movers and shakers of the preservation of soil fertility are fungi. They expand rapidly long distances. They lock up huge quantities of fertilizer ions and they store them long term along with enough water to prevent fertilizer burn. They encapsulate and eliminate salts if you have even sodium chloride. Uh, fungi are very good at encapsulating it, preventing it from harming plant roots. Uh, they moderate everything, but when you get too much salt, they die quickly. Okay. So, what happens to the fungi in the soil when you apply salt-based fertilizer? You'll find two groups of studies. If you start perusing the scientific literature, you'll find two groups of studies. One group of studies are looking at agricultural soils. They will measure the quantity of fungi in the soil. They will, produce, they will put down a normal quantity of fertilizer, and then they will come back and see what happens. And invariably, almost invariably, they will conclude that there was no change so soils, so the, and conclude that the fertilizer did not have an impact on soil fungi. Okay. The other set is looking in a natural forest or an undisturbed tall grass prairie. They will measure the soil fertility and then they'll put down a quantity of fertilizer equivalent to what you would do in an agricultural setting. And they'll observe a drop in fungi, particularly the all-important mycorrhizal fungi, which directly interface with plant roots and support the feeding of plants. We'll do a whole video sometime on, on soil fungi. There's not enough time in this one to go just beyond that surface level. They will conclude that there is then a problem with the application of fertilizer because they saw a drastic reduction in the soil fungi. If you lose that ecosystem service, you then must do work on your own to replace it, which means adding more fertilizer. Okay. Of all of the fertilizer ingredients, the one which is most harmful to the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil is phosphate. It doesn't matter whether that phosphate comes from bone meal or from an artificial manufactured fertilizer in a bag. Too much phosphate causes the plants to reject the symbiosis of the mycorrhizal fungi because they don't need it. This leads, if, so if you just look at the forestry studies and you see the drastic reduction in, in soil fertility and the, the microorganisms which maintain it after the application of a salt-based fertilizer, you can then jump to the conclusion that this must be the start of an addictive process. And it is in part. But there's more to it. An agricultural field is not a forest. And agricultural fields were heavily degraded prior to the beginning of the synthetic fertilizer age, prior to the Green Revolution. This happened in the first half of the 1900s when we got mechanical tractors pulling plows and really, really bad clear-cut forestry in combination. We eroded the vast majority. Most areas in the East Coast of the United States and the Midwest, you lost meters from your soil horizon. Okay, That's where all those fungi were in the first place. Now, I've said fungi are susceptible to salt burn, even more so than plants are. That's, that's a true thing. But an even faster way to kill them is to uh, remove organic content from the soil through oxidation or erosion and expose the soil to the heating of direct sunlight contact. That kills them even faster. Okay? So between 19, like the late 1800s and the start of the Green Revolution, when we started using these synthetic salt-based fertilizers in large quantity, we had already nuked most of our fungal diversity before we had the opportunity to measure the impact of the application of a salt to a healthy agricultural soil. They were already profoundly unhealthy soils. 
this erosion gully is currently stable. This happened a hundred years ago. Okay. This what this probably did not predate the onset of agriculture here in central New York, and it's stable now. This is a relic of the Dust Bowl era. Okay. And just look at how these banks slope and think about how much erosion happened here and how much silt from up top was carried down through this gully while that erosion was taking place. It's tremendous. So all the good fungi from up there went down here. And that occurred before salts were used. Now before salts were used also the primary fertilizer was manure. Okay. Manure is a salt-based fertilizer, but we're not really talking about bird manure mostly. We're talking cow manure, which is a much less salty source. Horse, sheep, and goat are less salty yet. Okay? So they have very low levels of nitrogen relative to chicken and bat guano. Okay? But they have tons of phosphate. So when you apply fertilizer, when you apply a manure-based fertilizer relative to the amount of nitrogen that corn needs, you're applying two or three times the phosphate that you should. What I say a minute ago, the most injurious nutrient to the soil fungi is too much phosphate because it causes plants to abort symbiosis with mycorrhizae. So when you're growing the nitrogen hogs, using cow manure is worse for your soil than using a little bit of ammonium or urea to supplement the nitrogen because you can get away from that over application of phosphate. And if you're in a limestone area, using naturally occurring potash in the form of ash is more injurious to the soil than using a synthetic relative closer to neutral pH straight up 0060. Oh, we've got a kitty friend coming. Hi, Tubby. Anyhow, um, photobombing kitties aside, we'll just leave that in. He's cute. You'll see him in a minute. The, uh, like I said, it's complicated. Where we are now in heavily degraded agricultural soils, we have concluded an addictive process. You cannot grow commercial scale crops without commercial fertilizers on any of our long cultivated arable lands. They are literally addicted. They are dependent. But that process has more causes than simply the invention of the synthetic fertilizers. Okay. So yes, it occurs. Yes, it has occurred. <laughs> Viewers, the reason the camera is shaking is because our kitty cat is rubbing on the legs of our tripod. <laughs> Adore, we, we've taken to calling him the, chem, the chaos gremlin. Anyway, the, uh, the process happens, but it doesn't happen quite the way that it's usually portrayed. We will get into the details of all of these little bits and pieces in future videos. We will do one just on the uh, mycorrhizae, we've already done some on the nutrient cycles. We'll talk about the life in the soil and how all of these things play into each other. But for a final take home point on this video, which I hope you've already given a thumbs up if you're this far in, it really helps the YouTube algorithm know to show it to other folks, is the answer to the question, if you're gonna use a salt-based fertilizer, and there are definitely reasons to do so in many cases, especially if you're on already degraded land, okay? You want to make sure that you're doing a soil test. You want to find out what the existing pH is. You want to find out what the existing nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash are so that you can make good decisions, supply the plants that you're putting in with the nutrients they need in a way that does not cause further problems, especially on the phosphate front. Okay? So there are reasons to not use salt-based fertilizers in certain settings, but there are also absolutely reasons to use them, including people that are working on setting up 
ag you know, um, agroforestry, silvopasture, regenerative grazing, all of those sorts of things are wonderful approaches. But when you're dealing with land that's already heavily degraded by the creation of these erosion gullies, followed by a hundred years of salt-based fertilizer application, another couple years of very intelligent salt-based agriculture, uh, salt-based fertilizer use, can help you transition from that mode of agriculture into another. And they are very good tools. And we live in a world where we need every tool that we can access. So use with caution, do your soil tests, and keep in mind how you're going to be applying them. Okay? When you get your soil test results, remember when I was talking about pure versus diluted fertilizer? Also keep in mind the accuracy of your application method. If you're scattering or have a really chintzy cheap model of spreader fertilizer, you can't apply them accurately you can still buy the better price point pure fertilizers, but cut it with some pelletized lime so that you're not over applying. Okay? So there's lots of things you can do to mitigate the risks of fertilizer burn and to use these tools to wean yourself off of fertilizer addiction. And I hope that you will stay tuned. I hope that you will like and subscribe to this video. And I hope that you will keep watching for more of these chalk talks, more of these in-depth, deep dives into the details of agriculture and how it works so that you can have all of the tools you need to create your sustainable homestead. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.